Sure, good to see everybody this morning. What a great crowd today. It's great to see everybody here. We're so glad that you're here, a part of this weekend's experience, and we are just absolutely thrilled that you're here at Bayshore this morning. And I want to say hello to our Fenwick Island campus. We have so many people watching us there. Would you give Fenwick Island a big hand right now? Pastor Jeremy and the whole team there, we love you guys. Thank you so much for being with us today. Also online, I want to just mention some people that are watching regularly online. Mary Schultz from Millsboro. Mary, thank you for watching. And uh, this is Daphine Never Lefer from Oxford, Pennsylvania. Forgive me for butchering your name there. Patricia Sinclair from Preston, Maryland. Debbie Thomas from Seaford. Patricia Marley from Frankfort, Delaware. And Paul and Renee from Ocean City, Maryland. Thank you guys so much for listening. Wherever you're listening from, we want to thank you so much for being a part of this weekend service. And also everybody that's listening on WGMD Radio 92.7. So thank you for being with us today. Let's give all of our listeners a big hand this morning. Thank you them for being a part of this weekend service. Well, we are in a series called Love Rules, and in this series, we're talking about what love is, how love uh, works in our life. And we've been basing this series on this quintessential chapter in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 13, which is probably the most uh, beautiful and most thorough development of love anywhere in all of literature. And Paul writes this incredible thing in, in uh 1 Corinthians 13 about what love is. And this is an incredible thing. And what he does in this chapter is he helps us to understand uh, what love looks like. And I think sometimes we have trouble kind of identifying what love looks like. And so he gives 15 characteristics of what love looks like and some things that it's good, some things that are bad. So it says love is, and then there's seven of those characteristics. And then there's eight characteristics of what love is not. So that's an important thing for us to uh, remember. Now, here's, a th here's something important for you to think about today when you think about love. Think about it this way. Love is not a spiritual gift. Love is not a spiritual gift. Love is not something that God just gives us automatically and we have just this full-blown, mature characteristic of love. Love is not a spiritual gift. Love is a fruit. It's not a spiritual gift. It's a fruit. It says in Galatians chapter 5, uh, 22, it says, uh, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, and joy. So the fruit of the Spirit is love. So a gift is something that if I give you a gift, it's something that you have automatically. You have it instantly. So if I wanted to give you an Apple Watch, and some of you would love to have an Apple Watch, if I gave you an Apple Watch and just handed it to you, you would instantly have that perfect Apple Watch. Fruit, on the other hand, is a process. Fruit takes time to grow. So when it says in Galatians 5.22, um, the fruit of the Spirit is love, what I know about love then is that love evolves. It evolves. It is a progressive thing. It is not just instantaneously given to us, but love grows. And you can see it in marriages. You know, you see couples that get married, they're 23, 24 years old, and they're madly in love with each other, and they're, they look at each other, and they're just uh, taken with each other's beauty and attractiveness, and there's love and physical attraction, and all that's going on. And uh, those of you that are over 50, you know, how many remember? You know, remember what you used to look like. You know, hey, we're, we're still, we're working at it right now, you know. If you're older, you're trying to look at, someone said that, uh, you know, love is, or, or that says that time. Time heals all things, but time is a lousy beautician. You know what I mean? But anyhow, so when you think about love, love is, you look at a couple that they, they get married and they have this, this, this impassion toward each other and they're lusting at each other and they're just so excited about each other. But then you watch that couple as they're together for 30 or 40 or 50 years and that love has gone to a whole new level whole new love. It's matured over time. Love matures over time. So the Bible says that love is a fruit, not a gift. And the uh, people of the city of Corinth, where Paul had this church, they were really big on spiritual gifts. You know, they were big on prophesying, and they were big on speaking in tongues. They were big on the word of knowledge and all these amazing gifts of healing. They were so pumped up about those things but Paul said, you know, listen, you can have all of that, and none of that, none of that is wrong. That all is good, but if you have all of that, but you don't have love, then it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything if we don't have love operating in our life. 
So basically, Paul says that, Trump, that, that, that love trumps everything, that love is more important than anything at all. So that's, a, that, that's what he begins. So he gives us these little descriptions of what love is. And so in verse, uh, verse number uh, 4 of 1 Corinthians uh, 13, it says it gives three things that love is not in, in 1 Corinthians 3, 13, 4. So there's the good things that love is, and then for Paul to help us to understand what love is not, uh, he helps us to kind of like show us the contrast. So here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 4. It does not envy. Love does not envy. It does not boast, and it is not proud. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. So here's what he says. First thing he says, love does not envy. Love does not envy. Now, what is envy? Now, envy is the word zealous in the Greek, and it means, it, here's what it means. It means to be jealous of. It means to burn with frustration. It's a strong feeling. You have a strong desire to have what somebody else has, and you are not happy that they have something. And the Bible says that love doesn't do that. Love celebrates the successes of other people. Love celebrates the progress of other people. Love does not feel diminished inside when somebody else is doing good. And so love is not jealous. Now, jealousy is a harsh word. Jealousy is a harsh word. When you think about jealousy, I've never had anybody in my entire ministry ever come to me and say, Pastor Danny, pray for me because I'm feeling jealous. Nobody's ever said that. Because jealousy and feeling jealous of someone and envious of something that somebody else has is not a virtue that any of us are proud of. But it must be a human frailty because Paul mentions throughout the book of Corinthians that the Corinthian people, even though they were spiritually gifted, they had all these gifts, they had jealousy in, in the midst of them. Because this is important to remember, you know, just because you have spiritual gifts operating in a church doesn't mean that you have spiritual maturity. Spiritual gifts can be present, but spiritual immaturity can be simultaneously happening along with that. So here's what's interesting here. Uh, Paul says that, that love does not, envy is not jealous. So nobody's ever come to me and said, you know, Pastor Danny, I, I fe I'm feeling jealous. You know what jealousy is like? Now, this is a little crude illustration here. But I don't know if you remember in high school when you used to get acne and you had uh, pimples. Anybody ever get a pimple when you were in high school? Just, you know, do you remember that? Like before the big date, you know, you got a giant pimple right on the end of your nose. And it just showed up, you know. And we called them, this is crude as well, we called them zits. And we had all this medicine. And, you know, when you get, there's a picture of somebody with a, a pimple there. And, uh, you know, we've had those. And it's embarrassing and you want to cover it up. And I think when you have jealousy in your heart, you are, it's like that. You're, it's embarrassing. And you don't admit that you have that. But evidently, human beings have the capacity to be jealous of the successes of other people. When other people are doing well, you know, you got a group of people, friends that are all together and they're at the restaurant and they're all, you know, trying to lose weight and they're laughing about nobody can lose weight, but they're trying. And then somebody starts losing weight and they really start losing weight. And then everybody else kind of gets, you know, who do they think they are? So sometimes you have that, you know, you struggle with celebrating the successes of other people uh, or you know, you, 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 you've been working hard in your business and you've been diligent and you've been working really hard and then all of a sudden somebody just breaks out and they're doing incredibly well in their business. And it's hard for you to celebrate their success or the successes of somebody else's children. You know, you want your children to be doing great and then you're somebody else's children, you know, they're speaking French when they're in fourth grade and, and they're, they're playing the violin and so there's those kind of things that happen. But envy... And jealousy is a real thing that we struggle with. And the Bible says that love is not jealous. Love is not uh, envious of another person. Love can celebrate the successes of other people because they can, a person filled with love can see that God is blessing another person and they can enter into that 
and celebrate that with them because they just see the goodness of God in another person that's a part of their heart and they love and care about them. So here's what I think uh, comes from when you have jealousy. Here's where I think it, it stems from. It stems from this. It stems from this idea that, um, that th- what Stephen Covey, who wrote the book Seven Habits of Affected People, Stephen Covey says that some people have a scarcity mentality, a scarcity mentality. Now, scarcity mentality refers to people that see life as a finite pie. In other words, if somebody, you know, it's just one pie in life, and if somebody gets a big piece of the pie, what does that mean? That means that there's less for me. So there's not as much for me. So some people look at life like, you know, a finite pie, that life is, you know, there's just so much, and if somebody gets blessed, that means that's less for me. So a scarcity mentality is a mentality that keeps us constantly living in an envious attitude and jealousy. Because if somebody is moving forward, someone's doing good, then they're getting you know, something and there's less for me. And for a person to be healthy, you need to be able to look at life as life has all of these opportunities for everybody. Life has all of these opportunities for everybody. It's just not that there's a finite amount of resources and a finite amount of blessings, but that we have an abundant God that when he blesses somebody, it doesn't diminish at all his ability to bless us as well. So looking at life that way, looking at life as as not a scarcity mentality where there's just a, just a little bit and, and if I don't get my part, if somebody gets a big piece, that's going to be less for me. That's a tormented way of living. But the best way to live is to live in an, with an attitude that there is an infinite God who has infinite blessings, who has infinite supplies, who has infinite opportunities, that there is a God who is able to bless everybody. And when somebody is blessed, it doesn't mean that God's not going to bless me, but we have an infinite God who, has, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and that he owns everything and he has all of these infinite resources. So a scarcity mentality is when you think like, you know, when somebody gets something, somebody's blessed, that means there's nothing left for me. So living that way will kind of keep you uh, in bondage. Imagine if there was somebody that was uh, hiking, you're hiking with a friend, and you're going down, uh, hiking out of the mountain, you're hiking along a stream, and you have a canteen. And you take the canteen, and you, and you dip it in the water, uh, and this beautiful stream of water, it's crystal clear mountain water, uh, and it's cold, icy cold, and you, and you fill your canteen up and you take a drink. And then somebody says to you, can I have a drink out of your canteen, the person that's hiking with you, if they say that to you. Now, how do you feel about that? Well, there's not a problem at all, because if you can give them something out of your canteen, that's not a problem, because there's, a, there's an infinite supply of water in the stream beside you. So when you think about God, think about it this way. If God blesses my neighbor, if God blesses my friend, uh, that doesn't mean that God has less to bless me with, but God has the capacity to bless everybody. And, and so when I see somebody blessed, I, I want to be able to celebrate their being blessed because God is a God of blessing. It says in Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And God's blessing is, is infinite. Say it with me. God's blessing is infinite. There's no limit to his ability to bless me. So part of uh, celebrating uh, life is being able to celebrate the, uh, the blessing of other people. And it says, love does not envy. Love does not envy. Love is not insecure about that. Now, I heard about uh, the singer when I was in uh, high school in the 70s, uh, there was this famous singer by the name of Linda Ronstadt. Anybody remember Linda Ronstadt? Her number one hit was, You're No Good, You're No Good, Baby, You're No Good. That was number one, her number one song. She did a lot of Buddy Holly songs, re- reproduced those songs. She sold 100 million, 100 million albums uh, worldwide and just really was incredibly successful. And she was just killing it and doing so good. She won all these, uh, all these awards and she uh, was very, very successful. And then along came Emily Lou Harris. 
Anybody ever hear Emily Lou Harris? She was a great, great singer, country, and had all this ability. And so uh, when Ro- Linda Ronstant heard uh, Emily Lou Harris sing for the first time, she said she had a mixed feeling about that. The first thing she thought was, wow, that's amazing. That is so good. The second thing she thought was, she is doing what I've been trying to do, and she's doing it a lot better. And Linda Ronstadt said in her memoirs, Simple Dreams, she said, in that split decision, I had to make a split second, I had to make a decision. If I could not celebrate Emily Lou Harris's skill in her music, that means for the rest of my life, every time I heard her sing a song, I was going to be tormented and I couldn't enjoy her music. So she decided that she was going to accept her gifts and celebrate Emma Lou Harris's incredible gifts. And so she said, you know, if I just feel like if I could just get in line with all the other fans of her and enjoy her music, that would be incredible. And, he, and she thought to herself, wouldn't it be incredible if one day I could record with Emily Lou Harris? Wouldn't it be incredible? So she accepted that and celebrated her, her gifts. Well, wouldn't you know, as time went on, that uh, Linda Ronstant and Emily Lou Harris met each other and they performed together with Dolly Parton an album called The Trio, which won incredible awards. And so she was able to enter in to the joy and the gifts of another person. So it's important for us, you know, love is the capacity not to envy, not to, uh, not to be jealous of another person, but to be able to celebrate with another person. So. There's not a scarcity mentality. You know, God has rich blessings for all of us. God has a specific plan for all of us. You know, if God blesses someone in a certain way, blesses their business in a certain way, enter into celebrating that. Uh, If somebody that you know is being uh, blessed, and you just need to enter into celebrating that because as you celebrate their success, you really open the doors for God to bless you. And that's an important thing. So many times we get all bound up. I heard about these uh, two uh, store owners that lived across the street from each other. They, they were competitors, competitors, fierce rivals. And every day as they watched each other, you know, the stores, whenever somebody came into their store and didn't go in the other person's store, they just were filled with delight that they were taking a customer away from the other person. There was this bitter rivalry that they constantly had uh, against each other. And uh, so one night, one of the shopkeepers had a dream, and the dream was this angel appeared to this shopkeeper and said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you anything you ask for, anything you ask for. But what I give you, whatever you ask for, if you ask for riches, if you ask for long life, whatever you ask for, I'm going to give your competitor twice as much twice as much. So this shopkeeper was struggling with the angst of that and couldn't, you know, boy, he just, he wanted to be blessed, but he didn't want the other person to be blessed. And finally he said, with a mean look on his face, my request is I want to be blind in one eye. I want to be blind in one eye. You know, hey, listen, when you can't celebrate the success of another person, you hurt yourself. You hurt yourself. Say that with me. When I cannot celebrate the success of another person, I can't be blessed. It's important for us to to remember that. So in families, you know, we got adult children that are jealous of each other in their homes. We have people that are jealous of each other's achievement of their kids. We've got people jealous of each other's status. You know, the brothers of Joseph in the Old Testament were jealous of of Joseph's uh, coat of many colors. And we have, if you look in the New Testament, you look at the book of Acts, you see wherever Paul went to these Greek cities in the in the uh, in the in in Turkey, ancient was Asia Minor then. Where all, whenever he went to these cities, all the people would come from the town to the synagogue, and the Jewish people uh, that were leaders of the synagogues would get very jealous of Paul and Silas. And it says in, Thessala, uh, uh, in Acts chapter 17, when Paul went to Thessalonica, that after he preached the first week, the whole city came the next week, and it says the Jewish people were jealous of him. So jealousy is something that really holds us back, and we need to move on. So the next thing it says, love, is, love does not envy, love does not envy, is not jealous, uh, love does not boast. 
Love does not boast. Now, here's, here's the thing about boasting. Boasting is something wh- that you do or I do uh, when we, uh, we put the spotlight on ourselves. We put the spotlight on ourselves in a kind of conversation. And uh, I think we have a picture of a spotlight. And uh, you got this, this is the image of someone that boasts. Maybe we don't have it. Um, but we have this uh, picture of a person that puts all of this focus on themselves and, and, and they become the centerpiece of the conversation. But, you know, the Bible says love doesn't seek to make myself feel big and others feel small. Love wants to make other people feel big and I honor other people. It says in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 3, let this attitude be in you that was also in Christ Jesus who valued others better than himself. So valuing other people. So when you have a conversation with people uh, and, you're, and you're conversing with people, uh, the Bible says love doesn't seek to elevate itself, but love seeks to elevate the people around them. And there's all these verses in the New Testament about encouraging, that we encourage one another, that we lift each other up, that we uh, honor each other. And encouragement is something we do. When you come in a conversation, you can have this attitude. The attitude, when you, somebody said when you walk in a room, you can have two attitudes. One attitude is you can walk into a room and you can say, here I am, here I am. Or you can walk into a room and you can say, there you are. There you are. So a person that has love is a there you are person. They, they, they recognize and they honor other people and they lift other people out, up. And so when I'm in a conversation, I know many of you do this as well, when I'm in a conversation, I want to make sure that in my conversation, the spotlight isn't just on me. Now, if you have a, you know, there's a thing called relational intelligence. A guy named Daniel Goldman wrote a book called Relational Intelligence, uh, I don't know how many years ago. And there's this thing about relational intelligence. People that have relational intelligence, they understand that, uh, that to have healthy relationships, you have to have a mutual giving and sharing in a relationship. And sometimes, have you ever talked to somebody that they only talk about themselves? They just constantly... Uh, incessantly just talk about themselves. They're just constantly talking about themselves, talking about themselves, and the spotlight in the whole conversation is on them. I had uh, lunch with a guy one time that wanted to have lunch with me, and, and, uh, and I was, you know, I love to have lunch with people, especially if they're buying. I just love to have lunch with people, you know. So um, I went to have lunch with this guy, and I met him at the restaurant, and uh, yeah, I was just really looking forward to talking to him. 45, 50 minutes, just everything about himself things he's done, some things he's accomplished and all that. And, you know, it's very interesting for like three minutes, you know, it was really interesting. And it's just the whole conversation. So I thought a healthy relationship is a relationship where you have mutual sharing. See, a relationship, a good relationship is like a tennis match with a rally. It goes back and forth. You share about yourself and you, you, you draw the other person out to have them share about themselves. And, uh, and you don't make it about yourself. You don't boast about yourself. You're not lifting yourself up. So in this conversation with this guy, I finally thought, well, I need to balance this out a little bit. So I wanted to be vulnerable so I could get closer to him. So I told him a little about my life and I got into that like, you know, two minutes and then he was gone. He could not focus. He was, he was just gone and he couldn't focus on anybody but himself. Say this to me, healthy relationships are relationships that focus on other people. And so you want to you want to make sure that you that you can do that that you can not uh, make it all about yourself and you can be a person that is able to to give and take and share. This week I was in a conversation with uh, my our insurance broker broker here at the church and we have health insurance for our staff and and uh, you know every year that goes up and it's negotiating all that and uh, I had an insurance question I called this guy Irv Tuning who's helped us with our insurance wonderful guy's been helping us for years. And uh, when I called Irv, said, oh, I'm so glad it's you. I just wanted to talk to you. And it was just so nice to be greeted that way. And he was just like so excited to help me. And he's talking to me about my, my insurance problem. And I was talking to him about my bum knee and things I'm trying to get worked on and all that. And he was just so engaging. And then, then I, I said, you know, Irv, I want you to know how much 
that I and Karen and our staff appreciate you. You have helped us. You've saved Bayshore thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars over the years. And you just have a, a ministry of helping people. So in a relationship, you have to have that, that give and take. And, and boasting, a person that boasts is a person that has low relational intelligence. They, they think the conversation has to center on them. And, and they aren't able to properly balance that. And, and it says love. Love wants to know how are you doing. Love wants to know what's going on in your life. And here's a great phrase to use in a relationship. A great phrase in a conversation is, what about you? What about you? So in your, in your relationship, it's very important. In your relationship, it's important to do that. So love does not boast. Love does not boast. Love does not envy. And love does not boast. So that's an important thing. Let me give you a, a little thing here I, I read about seven ways to make people feel important. And uh, you can kind of tuck these in. Seven ways to make people feel important. It's down here somewhere. Here we go. Seven effective ways to make others feel important. Number one, use their name. Use their name. When somebody says your name, you know, when somebody says Danny or somebody says your name, it's just there's something about everybody loves to hear their name. Remember what Jesus said in the garden of uh, in the garden story in the resurrection at Easter when Mary was crying and she didn't know what was going on, and then he says to her, Mary, he says her name. And say, say people's names. Important to say their name. That's an important thing. Uh, number two, express sincere gratitude. Express sincere gratitude. Thank people. Thank people for what they have done to be a blessing to you. Thank people. And uh, I called uh, yesterday. I, was, uh, I had trouble with my American Airline app on my phone. And uh, Karen and I are getting ready to go on a trip, and we haven't flown in, in quite a while, so I was trying to get the app straightened out and all this. And, I, and have you ever talked to one of those people, you know, in, this, in, the, in the service department, you know, on one of those, you know, when you have a technical problem, and they talk to you like you are a, you know, not very smart. I was thinking other words to say, but they talk to you about like not very smart. And I'm like, I'm doing my best to keep up with this. This lady was so patient with me. And uh, she, she could tell she had a, an elderly gentleman on the phone. She knew... There was this guy that barely know how to turn the computer on. You know what I mean? So, but she was just helping me. At one point, I said, you know, I'm taking too much time. I'm, we're not going to be able to solve this. She said, hang in there. We're going to get it done. So she stayed with me. And uh, I'm here to tell you that the American Airlines app is working on my phone now. You know, there it is. So that's a big success story. <laughs> but, uh, but afterwards, I said, you know, thank you so much. Thank you for helping me uh, express sincere Gratitude. Listen to this. Number three, seven effective ways to make others feel important. Use their name, express sincere gratitude. Number three, do more listening than talking. Do more listening than talking. The book of James confers with this. The book of James says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. Number four, uh, talk more about them than about you. Talk more about them than about you. So when you're with somebody, you know, instead of boasting, you want to find out about them, talk more about them. Uh, I take my sons out to lunch. You know, we have lunch together, and sometimes we do a little book study together. But, you know, when I go to visit my sons and, uh, and, and my wonderful daughter-in-laws, and when I'm with them, you know, I want to find out about their life. I want to find out what's going on in their life. And we, we talk about their life and we, we draw them out. So very, very important principles of, of finding out. Talk more about them than about you. Number five, be authentically interested. Like the guy in the restaurant. He, could, he was impossible. He had low emotional, uh, low emotional intelligence and he d could not even fake being interested. Be authentically interested. Number six, be sincere with your praise. And number seven, Show you care. Show you care. So that's an important principle. Show that you care. So seven things. Use their name. Express sincere gratitude. Do more listening than talking. Talk more about them than about you. Be authentically interested. Be sincere in your praise. Show you care. And that's from Roy T. Bennett, The Light in the Heart. So love does not envy. Say it with me. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Say love does not boast. 
Doesn't put the spotlight on you. Puts the spotlight on other people. And, and, and another little thing, if somebody tells you a story, don't, don't try to checkmate them on that story. Like, you know, you have ever talked to anybody, you say, hey, my family and I, we went to the moon on vacation. Like, well, we went to Mars. You ever had anybody like that? <laughs> so you don't want to, like, try to outdo. That's boasting. That's like, you know, uh, elevating yourself. The f- last thing is love is not proud. Love is not proud. Love is not proud. Now, here's two things about pride. Love is not proud. Number one about pride is any success that you and I have is not solely our success. Anything you achieve in life was not a solo act. Pride rep- recognizes that there has got to be humility in your life because any success and achievement you have definitely is related to other people that helped you and the Lord that helped you. So a person that's filled with pride is out of touch with the process that got them to a place of success. Every great athlete has, the, has in their wake coaches and people that help them, parents that believed in them. When I preach, uh, when I, there was a time when, you know, when I mean, this was new, a new craft for me, and my dad gave me opportunity to preach, and I wasn't any good. And Carl Vinson, a big church in Florida, he let me preach, and people helped me. And I had coach, I had people that coached me and helped me. I called my Old Testament professor last week. He's uh, like 87 years old, and uh, he just had written his la- one of his books. Maybe it's not his last book, but he sent it to me in the mail, and I read it. It was so good. And I called him and talked to him on the phone, and his voice was frail. And, uh, and I told him how much I loved his book, and he talked to me about my life, and my ministry, and I am, any success I have is connected to that man. Have you ever seen a, if you ever see a picture, maybe we have a picture of a a turtle, a turtle on a post. I don't know if we have, do we have, maybe not have any pictures today. They're all pictures are gone. Well, if you ever see a turtle on a post, (laughs) you ever see a turtle, there it is right there. Now, if you look at that picture, what do you know? That turtle didn't get up there by himself. Somebody put that turtle on that post. And every bit of success that we have has to do with other people helping us and the Lord helping us. It says, Paul said, I boast, but I'm going to boast in the Lord. I'm going to boast in the Lord. So our success has to always be tempered, even if we work hard. Working hard is such a good virtue. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, to all hard work, there's a profit, but that's a component of success. Hard work, but also the help of other people and also the blessing of the Lord. So a wise person doesn't boast. A wise person walks in humility toward uh, the Lord and toward other people, knowing that the Lord helped them to get where they are. So where I am and where you are, your successes are all related to other people. And the last thing about pride is this. Pride, uh, the one terrible thing about pride is pride thinks it's a closed system. A person has pride, thinks it's a closed system, meaning that they feel like they know everything without the input from the outside. And here's the thing about one of the greatest deficits of pride is a person that's humble that walks in humility is a person that listens. A person that's filled with pride has no ears. They don't hear and they are not able to uh, listen to other people. Now, here's the deficit in our culture right now. All the political angst and all the division in our culture has to do with my opinion. I know what's right. I know what's right. I know what's correct. And I know everything. But walking in healthy relationships is when you walk in a spirit of humility, knowing that you don't know everything. Say this with me right now. Just, I want you to make this admission. You know, just say this with me. I am sure that I know some things, but I don't know everything. So person that has pride doesn't recognize that. 
So when you recognize that you don't know everything, and here's the thing about this, that this is not very nice, but here's the thing about this. There's something right now that you believe with all your heart, you're convinced of, but you're wrong. We are all wrong about something. And walking in humility is walking in a spirit where you recognize what, what Paul said at the end of this chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. He said, we prophesy in part and we know in part. We see through a glass darkly as in a mirror, but one day we'll see face to face. We prophesy in part, we know in part. You know what I thought? I thought the older I got, the more I would know and the less I wouldn't know. I thought the older I got, the more I would know. But the older I get, the less I know. Because pride, love, is not proud. Pride, prideful. Love recognizes that everybody's a teacher. That everybody is someone that I can learn from. And so we've got great voices, we got great words, we got great understanding toward each other, but we lack humility where we can listen because it's the humble that listen and it's the pride, prideful that always talk. So love is not jealous, love is not envious, love does not boast, love is not proud. Love is humble. Would you lift your hands to the Lord right now and let the Holy Spirit just minister to you and help you as you walk in humility in your marriage, in your relationships with other people in our community that are different and think different? Lord, give us a spirit of humility. Give us a spirit of grace so we can not walk in arrogance and pride, but we can walk in humility toward each other. We ask you, Lord, to just bless us, and we thank you for loving us and caring for us, and we thank you this is going to be a great week. You're changing us. You're making us people of love. You're making us people of compassion. You're making us people that are like Jesus. The, the fruit of the Spirit of love is growing in our relationships. The fruit of the Spirit is growing in our hearts as we go through this time. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen.